Live from CUBE headquarters in Palo Alto, California, it's the Silicon Valley Friday Show with John Furrier. Hey, you're listening to the Silicon Valley Friday Show. I'm John Furrier, we're here on November 4th and I'm joined by Jeff Frick again and we have our new call in uh, box here. It's a blue cube blue for call-ins. Last week we had Dave Vellante. We're going to try to bring in Dave Vellante and potentially some other guests. Uh, Jeff, big week this week. So going down the rundown, we're going to talk about, you know, the Cubs won the World Series. Amazing. The election is right around the corner. So the last show before the election, you know, four days away. I'm talking about Obama Thank and goodness. his impact, I think, to the social media, the social president, I'm calling him. First president to really have a Twitter social presence. That's going to be a big thing to analyze. Microsoft got big news this week. And we got KubeCon next week. I'm going to try to see Andy Jassy in Seattle as well. And tons of earnings. Facebook, Fitbit, GoPro, Twilio, Hortonworks, Tableau Software. Tons of earnings to digest in one M&A deal. You know, Broadcom buys Brocade. And finally, we're introducing our new feature of the show as we experiment and iterate through the show. And that is every Friday we're going to do a VC of the week where we spin the wheel <laughs> and wherever it lands, we we'll call the on them ring. and we will ask them questions. If they can't get on the phone, we're going to just pontificate and opine about our experiences with that VC, good, bad, and the ugly, all here on the Friday show. So, um, maybe it could be good news for somebody in the morning meeting, whether they get financed or not. Well, you know, they you know they all pay attention to each other, but it's important for entrepreneurs to know really who's really doing the work. I mean, to me, the reason why I want to do this one, we know these. I've been out here for 18 years. I've been working with uh, the featured one this week is Gray Luck. I've known them for 20 years uh, and dealing with them. But it's good for entrepreneurs in the industry to know who's actually doing the work, who's out on the streets, who's helping entrepreneurs. Who do they work for? They work for the LPs, the limited right, partners. Right. They won't work for the entrepreneur in some cases. So this is important, and some VCs are certainly changing, and we can talk about talk about that. But Jeff, the number one story besides the election is the Cubs won the World Series. And uh, being a Red Sox fan, I know how it feels. Congratulations, everyone in Chicago. But I got to say, they stole it from the Indians, and all because of the tarp. Yeah, if it wasn't so what do you the think tarp, about the tarp? The tarp won the won the the World Series, and so is the tarp related to the lights at the at the Superdome? It was the same exact thing. The NFL. The tarp was what killed the Indians, and there was like five Twitter <laughs> handles already up. As soon as the tarp came out, we were laughing. What about King Le King LeBron? Do you think he's happy or sad? That I Cleveland? think he's very sad. They blew the oh, three. Oh, I don't know. Lead. He's the king. But it was very Red Sox esque. You know that tagging up play from first to second really was the game changer in that game. But again, Cubs. Pull out a miracle. Theo Epstein for president. That's what I saw on Twitter. <laughs> Ex Red Sox guy. So, yeah. you know, again, good to see Theo doing his thing in Boston in 04, doing his thing in Chi Town. The fun thing about October baseball, or I guess November baseball, is it's such a different game than any other game, and that all the tension is actually between the action, you know, while you're waiting for that next pitch. And they had so many great crowd shots in the back and forth where the Chicago guys were completely stressed and the Cleveland people were completely stressed. And there was one crack of the bat, just 100. 80 degree flip on the emotions. It's yeah. like no other sport when every single pitch, every play means so much. And that's why October baseball is so different than just one of 162 games. And, and really the tarp is all fun to talk about, but it really did kill the momentum that, that, that Cleveland had to put that game away. The jugular was exposed, tarp comes out, they go back. Turns out the players huddled in the in the, in the weight room. That's right. They regrouped as only. a team and, and kicked ass, very Red Sox-like. Again, if you remember in 04, the Red Sox were down to one out and Roberts stole second. They get a rally, they win four straight games against the Yankees. They were down 3-0. They win 4-3, then they swept everyone in, ever since. Let me so ask you another question, though, John. You, you, you grew up on the East Coast. That game ended at 1 a.m. East Coast time on a Monday night or a Tuesday night. I mean, is that long-term hurting, you know, the, the continual fan base at, at, as these things go later? and la It was late on the West Coast. I'm a huge uh, person who believes that that is absolutely flawed. They should get the games out earlier. I mean, I think... The East Coast, no kid's going to stay up to one no, with their, on a, with on their dad. I mean, that was what baseball is all about. You sit with your dad, you sit with your parents, you watch the game, and you have a good time. And that's killing football, too, by the way. You Absolutely. argue that football <laughs> has also been so commercialized that it's not a family and you know f family sport anymore. It's more uh, promoted. It's really kind or of a little ridiculous. More well, I mean, I, you know, the, there was not a rigged 
World Series with the tarp, even though some speculators saying it was rigged. But certainly the people are talking about the election being rigged. When WikiLeaks, we're going to talk about the impact of WikiLeaks on this election. And, uh, you know, this is really an interesting concept, Jeff, because this, to me, exposes the impact of transparency. And what the WikiLeaks points to is that what's going to happen, I think, in the tech business, certainly we'll do these VC segments, but it opens up the inner workings of how things get done. And they now have a new level of access to information and I think this is going to impact uh, the, every industry, including tech. And some people are going to see how decisions are made. They're going to see how people are thinking. And it's certainly going to change the culture. So I'm expecting the WikiLeaks impact to go way beyond the election. And we're already seeing it in Silicon Valley where the, you know people are getting exposed to the, the inside the baseball or ropes, if you will. And yeah, most kitchens are not club. very clean, John. You don't want to go into the kitchen. Um, <laughs> the sausage factory, enjoy the sausage, have a good brat, uh, but but you don't want to go back in, in there. And and I think it is exposing it, and, and I think it's a good thing because there is no – you know, no cleanliness. These are regular people, real people. It's political. It's it's ugly. It is what it is. But I do, you know, and I wore my, my shirt today because it's our last Friday show before yeah. the election. And, and I do just want to reinforce a couple of messages. One is get out and vote. What, whatever you feel about the presidential piece, there's a lot of local stuff that happens, school board stuff. Uh, local laws. It's very important to get out and, and do your vote. Um, and the other thing is I was having an exchange um, uh, with Rebecca Knight, and we were talking about politics because uh, she's she's uh, very into this season. But but I wanted Rebecca to, Knight, our, one of our co-hosts. One of our co -hosts, but we talked about some some things I want to recommend to people to go read. The, the problem I think in politics today is it's so polarizing. You can't have a conversation with different points of view. And there's two really great books by Doris Kearns Goodwell, Team of Rivals, The Political Genius of Abraham Lincoln, where he specifically brought I, people together, John, that didn't like each other and learned from them all. He forced them to work together. And Joseph Ellis, Founding Brothers, The Founding Generation. These are really great books in this ugly, dirty, nasty time. Go read, you know, kind okay, of reset okay. on what's going on. Jeff's got a soapbox. Absolutely. Okay, put that away. Let's get back <laughs> down to business here. Um, in the tech business, obviously, the Obama thing also is, is something I want to talk about because Obama has become the first social president, first one with a Twitter handle, first one on Facebook. And I think he doesn't get enough credit, certainly in, around the world, around being a tech-oriented president. Uh, my son Alex shook his hand when he was at his inauguration when, as part of the video crew at Palo Alto High School. But you know, he's open. He, he's open president, and he's brought Silicon Valley closer to Washington. I think for the first time in my life, I've seen the tech industry actually become more policy driven. And I think this is going to affect people's lives more. And it's a good thing. I think Obama doesn't get enough credit for that. You're seeing, you know, the CTO, uh, Megan Smith, she was at Grace Hopper. Again, that's a positive thing. And I don't think Obama gets the credit for that. Not sure Hillary or Trump would, is going to support that. Obviously, Hillary is big time supported here. So she would be a better president for Silicon Valley. Yeah, I think people forget the huge impact that Washington has on what goes on out here. I mean, Intel got really rolling because of Sputnik. They would do anything to get a lower weight uh, horsepower to get a satellite in to chase the Russians. So huge spins in DARPA and, and other well, federal the programs. Well, the cybersecurity thing, is, the, the WikiLeaks, again, the, the, the hacks on WikiLeaks points to the fact that, you know, the tech business, tech industry is actually instrumental in protecting our freedoms because you think of cybersecurity, <laughs> just the hacks alone are impacting the election, but even other liberties are at risk. So and we've talked about that before. Uh, other big news, Microsoft had a big announcement. We're going to talk in our in-depth segment down uh, in the next segment, the impact of Microsoft's announcement with this team product and the impact to the leader in the area, Slack, uh, and others, and, and there was an article in the uh, full page ad in the Wall in New York Times. We're going to talk about. Uh, we have KubeCon next week uh, in Seattle. That's Kubernetes conference. Uh, it's a big geek conference around containers and the impact of containers, as well as I'm trying to get a one-on-one -on with Andy Jassy, uh, the CEO of Amazon Web Services, next week to get more data for you. So you look for the Cube to be there. Uh, and then finally, the earnings, uh, Jeff. Facebook had good earnings, all on mobile ad revenue. Fitbit had. Uh, below earnings. They didn't meet their earnings. GoPro lost half their revenue and half their earnings. They're plummeting, and that was a huge hit. Their stock's down big time. Twilio is a cloud services company no one's ever heard of, but they're Silicon Valley based, but points to the cloud as a disruptor. We're gonna, we'll analyze that in the next segment. And finally, Tableau Software um, not hitting their expectations. So yeah, you're starting to see the, the earnings, the, the scoreboard, if you will, start to tease out some of the indicators in the business. And that's going to be the sub subject of our, of our next segment. And of course, we've got the Greylock VC of the week. We're going to go in there. I got a note from Jerry Chen last night. What do you need? I'll see a big fan for Jerry. A shout out to Greylock. We're going to go in depth on that. So 
We're going to hear the changes in tech next segment. You watch it. You're listening to the Silicon Valley Friday show. I'm John Furrier with Jeff Frick. We'll be right back with more after this short break. Since the dawn of big data, the cube has been there. Connecting with executives, practitioners, entrepreneurs, thought leaders. But you're not a thought leader anymore, you're a futurist. That's the new trend. Futurist is the buzzword. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm very much living in the past. <laughs> I don't like the future. And I don't think much of the present. And John Cleese. There's, there's a whole lot of people out there who have no idea what they're doing, but they have absolutely no idea that they have no idea what they're doing. And those are the ones with the confidence of stupidity who finish up in power. That's why the planet doesn't work. Knowledgeable, insightful, and a true gentleman. And the guy at the counter recognized me and said, are you listening? Yes, I'm tweeting away. So you're not I tweet, tweet. I'm tweeting away. He is kind of rude that way, but. keyboard. <laughs> John Cleese joins the Cube alumni. Welcome, John. You got any phone calls you need to answer? Hold on, let me check. The Cube is a comfortable place. You come inside the Cube and we have a conversation, uh, almost as if it were a, a, a chance meeting. And we have a, a discussion about a particular topic. Our philosophy is everybody's expert at something. Everybody's passionate about something and has real deep knowledge about that something. Well, we want to focus in on that area and extract that knowledge and share it with our communities. Folks who have never heard of it before come in the Cube and say, wow, this is really cool what you guys are doing. It's unique, it adds value to the community, and it adds value by really sharing information. I can't tell you how many people stop me at conferences or on the streets, on our airports, say, hey, I love your show. People that I've never met before, they say to me, I know you, you don't know me. I watch the Cube, I queue up your videos, I listen to them while I'm on the, the treadmill. You know, it helps me, you know, learn, expands my knowledge, you know, thank you. So, you know, it's really an honor to be part of that community. This is Dave Vellante. Thanks for watching The Cube. You're listening to the Silicon Valley Friday Show with John Furrier. Okay, we're back. You're listening to the Silicon Valley Friday Show. I'm John Furrier. And joining me today is Jeff Frick. And we're on segment number two. We're going into a little bit more depth. And, and the topic here, Jeff, is really more of the impact of the changing landscape of the tech business and how it affects society. Um, some interesting news hit this week. The mobile usage surpasses web usage for the first time ever, meaning the mobile first, the mobile revolution, the iPhone. Go back to your point in history, whether it's 2007 or not, the iPhone and everything else is changing the game. Mobile usage by consumers and business users have surpassed the web browser usage for the first time, which is a huge tell sign, which yeah, means yeah. everything's going mobile as predicted right. by all the pundits and also everyone's investing in mobile. So that is a huge, huge deal, which means, what does it mean? It means that the expectations of the users are completely changed and the disruption opportunities are massive. And the opportunity, there's a couple things there too, right? The way you interact with the phone app is completely different than when you sit down at your computer, right? You're not, it's not a session, it's a grab a few minutes. So the way the apps work is very different. You're in line at Safeway, you're in line at Pete's, you're in line at wherever you're driving to the kid's game. Don't check your phone then. Um, so that's a big one. The other thing is there's a lot of native stuff in the phone that gives the app so much more information than you get in your desktop browser, where you are, how fast you're moving. You can put all kinds of things on the phone that they don't necessarily put in the browser. The phone has native capabilities like the camera. Stuff. That's where Snapchat the came camera, from. Exactly. Uber, ordering, ordering cars. I mean, this is the thing. I mean, right now people always ask why, what, what, why the Cube makes certain selections of where we go. We're going to be at CubeCon, KubernetesCon next week. Really just reinforces that whole point that the application developers, people who build apps for phones, are developing new technologies like Kubernetes, like containers. I'm wearing my DockerCon shirt from Docker, makes containers. Uh, Jerry Chen's an investor from Greyluck, ironically. Um, no coincidence there. But again, this is changing the business model. You're seeing the developers on the front lines making apps, as you mentioned, whether it's shopping at Safeway, getting stuff delivered to your home, or changing the consumer experience with their life. Right, and right. this absolutely is highlighted by things like Uber and Airbnb, right. uh, social networks like Facebook. And this is the disruption of innovation happening right now so right. I mean just look at the look at the seat change we were talking before we came on about you know Uber drivers not getting health insurance should they be classified as employees kind of goes back to that whole government thing it, that, what ultimately I think the government is going to redefine some of these new uh, new ways to work when they're not getting their their tax money just a quick note I think I saw a tweet too that um, 
Jim McClucky from Google, who named Kubernetes, uh, gave us Craig. a story, or Craig, Craig excuse McClucky. me, is leaving Google. So it'll be interesting to see where he shows up he's gonna, next. He's going to go do a startup from his tweet. But again, this brings up the whole point. It's not just Uber. Think about like the conversations we had about Twitter in the past and the media during this election. that We just talked about WikiLeaks. This new real-time environment, access to the data, is absolutely changing people are connected now you got wearables we wrote a story on silicon angle that we there's now bras that have health monitors in them you know for women something i mean every everything's changing right the changing whole fast. consumerization this is huge deal huge deal um and then we're seeing that in the earnings this week we saw facebook we saw tableau we saw twilio cloud company and the and the impact of the earnings to me is that the, it's the scoreboard of the health of the company and then you look at them you say hmm What's going on? And ultimately, it points down to obviously the mobile we just talked about, but the cloud computing is changing the game, and that ultimately is the thing. And you know, when I to walk around Silicon Valley and Palo Alto and around town, it's clear that the venture capitalists are not investing in infrastructure. They look at the cloud game and saying, "Wow, this thing is disrupting." And we talked about it a little bit last week. The bets might not come home, so people don't know what to bet on yet. <laughs> so the game is changing. The um, you know, one quote I heard last week was from a venture capitalist is that the plumbers, if you will, plumbers in the technology parlance means guys who set up servers and networks, uh, you know, called plumbers because they make the plumbing work for the, for, the, for the bits, are being turned into machinists. What that means is in an industrial revolution way, the game's changing, so their jobs are changing, the economics are changing, so this is a huge deal. The cloud is turning plumbers into machinists. This is a transformation. Yeah, absolutely, and and, and there's a lot of talk about how there's going to be a huge change in the jobs. Computers are going to take jobs. Yeah, they're going to take a lot of jobs, but there'll be new jobs. you gotta, you got to figure out new places to play, and there'll be there'll be new new ways. So we're introducing a new segment on the show called uh, Venture Capitalist of the Week, VC Firm of the Week. And the reason why is, one, we live here, so we see all of them. We know all of them. We talk to them intimately. We know their secrets. We know their trade secrets. We know their, their uh, we know what's going on behind the, behind closed doors. And, and we talk to people on the streets, and here's what I'm hearing. The number one question I get, and the reason why we're doing this is, I get asked all the time, who's the best VC? Who should I go to for cash? And that's ultimately a decision entrepreneurs are making when they look at growing their business. They want to pick a partner, and picking a VC is like getting married. Once you pick a VC, you're in, you're in, and it's really a partnership. So that is probably the most important decision an entrepreneur makes, whether you know whether they bootstrap to financing or they start out with an idea that needs capital. They got to go to the bank, if you will, and the bank here in Silicon Valley is the venture capital business. So, you know, that is a natural question. So we want to do that and highlight that. And our first inaugural pick of the week or discussion of the week is Greylock, Greylock Venture Capital. So Jeff, thoughts on Greylock are very, pretty clear to me. And the reason why I picked them first is I like the firm a lot. I think this firm has transformed from an East Coast firm. My first experience with them was 20 years ago uh, when they were on the East Coast, mainly in Boston, and then moved out to the West Coast as a small satellite office. And the West Coast has become just a, as just a powerhouse. They've really done amazing deals. If you look at what they've done here in Silicon Valley, they've invested in Facebook Series B, LinkedIn Series B, Airbnb, uh, one of the, some of the best consumer hits in the industry that are changing the game, Cloudera and the Enterprise, Pure Storage, um, you know, Workday. Um, they have partners like Anil over there, who's the CEO of Workday. Jerry Chen has been on the Cube many times as a young young partner. So they have a great consumer focus as well as an enterprise focus. So you know, they got a new blood in the in the firm. They got these the, the new partners coming in. They just hired. Um, uh, the, a female partner who from Pinterest, amazing person. She's got experience uh, in, in consumer. But here's what I like about Greylock. And I have some, some weaknesses too, I will highlight in a second. But the strengths for Greylock are they focus on scale. They want to create billion dollar companies. So they're very clear in what they do. They say to entrepreneurs, if you want cash from us, we want a billion dollar plus venture. Not a mom and pop, not a lifestyle business. We've got a billion dollars. And they focus all their energy on scale. And the partners are approachable. Um, John Lilly many times responds on on uh, text and Facebook and email. Jerry Chen is super awesome on the Cube. Um, and they have a lot of other young partners that are coming up. So again, super good people, great positioning. And they've just done a lot of great deals. And they have a great network. Obviously, Reed Hoffman, founder of LinkedIn. Uh, the other thing about Greylock is that they kind of got this society changing game going on where they're actually interested in, you know, changing the society and changing the world. 
which I would say is an authentic mission, but it's not the primary. Some people do it as kind of like a promotional thing, but Greylock, I think, has an authentic action on, hey, we want to make money, but we also want to change society. So that's my take. Yeah, I think what's the really important takeaways for entrepreneurs is is the company, and it used to be a relatively short list of the eight of the A team back, you know, twenty years ago. It was Kleiner Perkins, it was Sequoia, it was Excel. There was just a couple, but but more important than the company, and the company's important is your individual partner, because as you said, it is like a marriage. It's a very intimate relationship. Yeah. You're together at the hip for a very very long time. You need someone that's going to help you scale your business, and so I think it's really the individuals that make the difference, and the specific individual who's got experience yeah. connection is going to help you as an entrepreneur grow your business yeah i mean i think that you know if i had to like um put a critique on Greylock, and i think the thing that they should work on in my opinion again this is my opinion they 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 seem very weak on series a deals and everyone says oh no we do series a deals if you look at their track record they have you know do a lot of series b's and i think that's interesting and smart because the entrepreneurial game's changing. It used to be Series A was where you got your cash, but now there's kind of what I call a blue collar effect going on in the entrepreneurial worlds, where you know people are the smart entrepreneurs are actually getting stuff off the ground quickly. So Series B is kind of like the new Series A. So you know my only ding on Greylock on that area is they they don't do a lot of seed. Now there's micro VCs out there, but you know I, that could be a strength. You could look at that strength, but I think you know they don't they should put a little bit more cash out there for the, some of the seed deals uh, there. And the other one is is that they they're uh, uh, they, it seems like a white boys club, right? I mean, to me, it's like that's you worry about the VCs being like monolithic and monotone. And I think you know, Greylock has been been trying to hire more diversity, and that's a just a, a critique on all VCs. But you know, you worry that it is a with VCs, it's an elite factor. I went to Harvard, I went to Stanford. And I think that's the one critique I'd say on on Greylock is they got to get outside that uh, you know elite bubble and get down in the trenches a little bit more. Um, they do. A, Probably better than anyone else. I see Jerry Chen out there. He's one partner that I think is always out in the trenches. Um, the other partners I don't see much out there. So, you know, that would be my, my only critique on on Greylock. Other than that, they're a damn good firm. I think they're tier one all the way. Um, but I think they got some work to do on that. So that's Greylock. That's my take on Greylock. A lot of sh- more strengths than weaknesses. Um, and Jeff, what are you hearing? I mean, you hear anything about those guys? What's your take on You know, that? again, as you said, what's fun is when you see them at the shows, right? When they're out working the booths, literally working up and down the lines at the booths. You'll see a ton of them at reInvent here in a couple of weeks. Um, you know, getting it done versus being kind of on the hallowed halls on Sand Hill where nobody can get to them. And you got to go through three people that you know, a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend to maybe get yeah. an audience. And that's not how you get the great deals because it isn't just go to KP, go to Klein or go to Excel anymore. That's, that's just not the way that it works. I mean, I think the, 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 the one of the things I like about Greylock is they do authentically like the entrepreneurs and they have a good enterprise piece. So most people mail it in on the enterprise side. If you look at the tier one VC Sequoias, and we'll get to them in another week, but Greylock has a great enterprise group. I mean, they actually do great deals and they have great successes under their belt and they are, we do see them out in the trenches. The thing I worry about the VCs, and this is one thing entrepreneurs should always be aware of, is that, you know, they who it's like a realtor. Who do they work for? They work for the buyer, right? So the VC business is about, they work for the returns. So, you know, I think um, that's something that's always being mindful is that the VCs work for the limited partners. They got to produce a return. They're not in, it's not philanthropy. They're not just giving cash to entrepreneurs. They need to make money. So timing of investment is critical. You got to understand that once you go down that VC road, you have to go down that path. You've got to produce a return. So it's well, pressure. The other, the other thing is VCs have a portfolio, and most entrepreneurs do not. I think that's the other big thing that, that separates the two in terms of you're all in. If you're an entrepreneur, you are all in yeah. on your business. Potentially, you're mortgaging your house. Your kids are wearing old shoes. Uh, you're all in. A VC's got a portfolio of plays that he's betting on, and he doesn't need them all to come home. So I think yeah. that's another huge distinction between a venture capitalist and you on your Yeah, the board. relevance to what you're saying really comes down to this. The VCs is about the partner you mentioned, but what you're talking about now is they have business to run, they got to produce returns. So that's their primary goal. But the, how I judge the VCs is by the people that they have in the firm, and two, are they adding value? I mean, some VCs actually don't even try to add value. They give it the cash, they sit back and let that horse run. Some VCs are more, more hands-on. Greylock is definitely more hands-on. Um, with entrepreneurs, they actually are add they add value. Um, one of the things about Greylock, giving them a quick plug here, is that they did this awesome blitz scaling program at Stanford. Free content, 
They went out there and they share. They share information. They they blog a lot. Um, so they're out there helping. So I think, you know, at the end of the day, added value becomes second, getting the returns. So they add value to get the returns. Uh, and a lot of VCs mail in the quote value add, and I call that a value subtract. Most entrepreneurs don't want don't want meddling in in, in their business, but they want value add. So Greylock, great tier one, first VC featured here on Silicon Valley Friday show. I'm John Furrier. Joining me today is Jeff Frick. We'll be back with more in the Thinking Out Loud segment. We're going to talk in depth about Microsoft and Slack, some of the competitive <laughs> strategy going on in this transformation market, what it means for you as, as, as a buyer of software, and what it means to the companies, how to compete in the world as it's changing so fast. We'll be right back. I remember when I had such a fantastic batting practice, I walked by a couple of sports writers in that era. Hall of Famer, Reggie Jackson. It was like, you were rocking it out there. I, 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 I kind of hope I didn't leave it out here. Reggie <laughs> <laughs> Jackson. When the game started, right, right. I got back in that moment. Right. I got back in what was live, what was now. Right. Goodbye. Goodbye. I went and did a uh, something with ESPN earlier this year with Stephen Curry. They said, Reggie, we want you to come up and watch his practice, his pregame. You know, it was very similar to your batting practice where people come out and watch, etc. And I watched the dribbling exhibition. I watched the going between the legs and the behind the back and the fancy passing, etc. And I watched the shots. And the guy asked me what I thought of the show. And I said, well, it, it's a cool show but I'm going to see all that tonight. He does all that. He brought said, it into the game. Yeah, I said, so it, <laughs> it's, a, it's not a show, but that's his game. Mr. October. I think our world now, with the instant gratification of, of sending out a message or tweeting to someone or some, whatever, certainly in the moment, uh, is about what our youth is and, and who we are today as, as a country, as a, as a universe. Congratulations, Reggie Jackson. You are CUBE alumni. Hi, I'm Stu Miniman. I've been an analyst with Wikibon and a co-host of the CUBE since 2010. It's been an exciting journey working with the Cube. Uh, we get to go out to so many shows, help extract the signal from the noise, uh, interact with such a wide variety of, uh, of, of clientele, both practitioners, thought leaders, some big name uh, industry people, and we've helped some people uh, raise their profiles in there. Uh, especially love working with those practitioners. Uh, we've seen them move their careers forward and move their businesses forward as they take advantage of uh, technologies and practices uh, that they've learned. Talking with us, working with our research people, People and working with their peers. This is Stu Miniman. Thanks for watching The Cube. You're listening to the Silicon Valley Friday Show with John Furrier. All right, we're going to go live. And okay, you're listening to the Silicon Valley Friday Show. I'm John Furrier. Joining me today is Jeff Frick, and we have on the line Jerry Chen, one of the partners at Greylock, who we were just talking about behind your back, if you're not watching live. Uh, Jerry, how are you? I'm great this morning, John. How are you? So we were just giving props to Greylock about how good you guys are. I guess we had some critique in there, but I don't think it was we were stretching there. But you're a partner over there. Give us what's going on inside Greylock. What's happening? What What are you guys doing for deals? How big is the fund? What's happening? You know, I think we saw the announcement. We just announced our uh, 15th fund um, a month ago. Uh, so it's kind of amazing to think like 51 years of pitching funds with a billion dollars we started investing in 2017. And uh, we're just going to do what we've always done is try to find great founders, great entrepreneurs in um, our two core areas, which would be enterprise software and consumer internet software. So there's a couple of new things that I think as you rethink that definition, like self-driving cars or AI and other technologies out there. But I think the core is still software, consumer enterprise. But, you know, as software kind of uh, eats the world, so to speak, we'll see technology permeate every single vertical and every single use case. So we're excited. We're looking forward to uh, keep investing. Yeah, that's awesome, Jerry. You know, we're going to see you on the Cube at Amazon reInvent. It's going to be awesome. I'm wearing actually my DockerCon shirt today, so ironic. And it's you know, I actually didn't think about it when I put it on, but it's so comfortable. Um, CubeCon is next week, um, so a lot of stuffs happening. We just talked about the mobile use is surpassing um, web for the first time. You mentioned self-driving cars. It's a software business right now, certainly on the enterprise converging with consumers. So I got to ask you, with all the earnings reports coming out, it seems like the sea change is happening. So the question is, who's disrupting who out there right now? 
I mean, you saw Microsoft yeah. come out. Slack puts in a kind of a feeble full page ad saying we're afraid. Don't take us. Don't take us out. But yet gets their attention. I mean, that's is that a good competitive strategy? What who's disrupting who in this market? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's interesting. Technology goes in waves, and really, it's not necessarily who's disrupting who, but what waves disrupting the current incumbents. So, like the PC wave disrupted uh, many computers, mainframes, and the cloud mobile disrupted, you know, uh, on-premise software. So, I think the question is, what's the next wave? So, mobile is clearly a wave that's been um, driving technology for the past. You know, three, four, five years, and it's been 10 years since the iPhone came out, but really the past five years since, um, you know, smartphone penetration has really reached critical mass. And I, I think what people are looking now are what's next wave, and the reason why um, VCs and, and entrepreneurs are excited about things like VR or conversational platforms like Amazon Echo or Google Home or even cloud-connected homes, computers, cars, or cloud-connected industrial devices, uh, be it you know, jet engines and factories, those are new nodes. Those are new uh, distribution points to get software to the end user. And so I think that wave of where now software doesn't go to just the phone, but goes everywhere. Your glasses, your watch, your car, your jet engine, your, um, your factory, your light bulb, that's disruptive because all of a sudden it represents a new channel from the technology provider to the end user be it an enterprise or a consumer, and all of a sudden every incumbent that made the business on PCs was disrupted by the phone. Now every incumbent who's making the business on a phone now has to think about how this software can be rewritten for this totally distributed generation. You're listening to Jerry Chen, partner at Greylock. Jeff, you had a question yeah, for- Yeah, Jerry, uh, Jeff Rick here, how you doing? Quick question. Great, Jeff, As good to hear from you too. You go through all those different devices you just listed off from, from light bulbs to GE uh, jet engines, a huge attack area for, for uh, cyber crime. We just had the big DDoS uh, outage a couple of weeks ago. How much more investment needs to be made in security around all this new software that's distributed and connected everywhere? Uh, yeah, I, I think there's, there's going to be a ton of new investment in security around all this new software for all those regions. A, uh, all the new endpoints that are connected to the Internet, B, uh, the way people are being hacked now uh, are just changing every single year, uh, day in, day out. So I think there's going to be a lot more investment security because I think the innovation required to fight crime um, clearly hasn't worked the past few years, right? People are still breaking through the current barriers. So I think more has to be done. So I think what we're actually bullish um, for the next cycle around security investments, both classical security around enterprise software, but also security things like your car, your home, um, your light bulb, your jet engine. Security is huge. Definitely, totally agree. Totally bullish in terms of the opportunity. It's a, it's really not a good environment right now with all these hacks, WikiLeaks, everything else going on. But Jerry, the thing I want to ask you because you are you're part of the VMware mafia. You were ran cloud at VMware. You know that business. You invested in Docker. You're always always out in the trenches, which we gave you a lot of props for. And 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 you've got great hustle. You're seeing a lot of things. What's going on in the infrastructure market right now? We're hearing that there's a cold freeze going on on investment in uh, servers and storage. <laughs> Companies, you guys do have an investment in pure storage, which was you know years ago, but and they're doing very well. But you know, people are saying that the plumbers are turning into machinists, right? So what is happening with cloud is completely, you know, putting a wet blanket of uh, on that on the infrastructure business. Where's it going? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think infrastructure is always an exciting market because that's the thing that enables you to build things like the cloud and Internet of Things and all these new technologies. I mean, as, as a plumber and a machinist, you know, I think I, I do code, um, I'm still bullish on infrastructure going forward. But I think what you're seeing is a cyclical, cyclical trend of infrastructure evolving from on-premise to cloud. And so if you think about the cloud, Amazon has been that, you know, giant 800-pound gorilla for the past two years. It's only been recently since Azure and Google have really um, become and seen become more relevant. So I think the past few years have been tough because unless you had a good cloud story as an infrastructure company, uh, you really, really struggle to kind of tell your story to investors and to customers. But I think companies are figuring it out. Like technology like Docker, like you mentioned, Docker's going to become the platform for cloud portability for applications across Google, Azure, Amazon, and VMware. And so I think in that world where now you're seeing um, viable options appear, both on-premise and off-premise, infrastructure gets a lot more interesting now, especially A, as Jeff points out, you can secure it better, and B, you have a multi-cloud story that enables you to build all these next-gen applications.
You listen to Jerry Chen. He'll be at on the cube at Amazon reInvent. So look for him on the on the first day. So look for look for Jerry Chen. Uh, yeah, Jerry. Just quickly, just final point. I want to get your thoughts on. Obviously, Microsoft announced Teams and all Windows 10s around the corner. But specifically, Slack, the leader at the top of the hill. They have the high ground, certainly in that messaging area and chat. You know, kind of put an ad out there and said, you know, kind of snarky at Microsoft saying, hey, you know, get their attention. How does a startup compete? Because Greylock, you guys have successfully invested in disruptors like Facebook on the Series B, LinkedIn on the Series B, Airbnb, and the list goes on and on. And you had very successful startups that have turned into billion dollar companies. So how do companies today compete either existing Series B or Series C companies, or even Series A companies, as the rich get richer, like Oracle and Microsoft, try to come in and you know, muscle in and take territory from the startups. How, what, what's your advice? Because you guys are all about scale. Give us your thoughts. Yeah, uh, you know, I think the race, historically, my partner Neil says, is between um, technology versus distribution, right? David versus Goliath. So as a new startup, you have better technology. The incumbents like Microsoft have better distribution. Salesforce, channel, customers, et cetera. So it's really a race. You, you come to like a Greylock and a great VC because they're going to help you, A, build a product, recruit the team. But also we think a lot about distribution. On the consumer side, it's about virality and social connectivity. On the enterprise side, it's figure out what's your advantage to distribution. Your advantage to market, your advantage to distribution. could be viral, what's flashing viral. It could be finding the right partners in the cloud or with, with different software vendors. But trying to build that distribution channel to reach the customer for their better technology before the incumbents like Microsoft can buy or M&A their way into your market. So that race has played out for the past 40 years technology, and I think it's going to keep playing out. And we're so bullish on startups because the ability for them to out-execute and out-innovate um, has been yeah. proven over the past two, three so decades. So the game is still so, the same. Be nimble and take them down. David yeah. McGuire's story <laughs> continues. Yep, yep. All right, Jerry, thanks so much. Want to ask one final question. You guys in the partnership at Greylock, as you sit around the, the, the conference room table among partners, what's the thing that you guys talk about that you self-reflect on yourselves and say, we have to work better on as a VC firm? What do you guys say is your needs improvement area for a VC firm? You know, as a partnership, you know, there, there are 10 active uh, uh, main GPs. I think we need to talk about, uh, we always talk about how we can work better together, which is basically, you know, I think individually we're all great investors, but I think as a team, when we come together, we're, we're unbeatable as a team. And so we always talk about how we just can work better together. And um, I think that's an ongoing, ongoing journey, like all great teams are from, you know, the Warriors to, uh, to pick your favorite sports franchise, like any company, any team's no different. So we just want to work better together. And yeah. I think that's, that's really internally what we think about. More Series A's on the horizon or Series B's pretty much? Billions, a lot of money uh, to work. I think a lot. You know, I think we're about to go in early. Uh, the last <laughs> couple of projects I've worked on personally were Series A's and um, C deals. So even earlier than a Series A, like you know, $1 to $2 million dollar checks. So I think you're going to see us go, um, go super early in, uh, in some cases. All right, right Jerry uh, Chen, partner at Greylock, great friend of the Cube, and always great someone. To Thanks for picking up the phone. We were just doing a little randomly dialing the VCs. Ironically, we talked about Greylock today. Congratulations. Uh, great to see you and uh, hear from you. We'll see you at... Uh, AWS reInvent. Uh, this, this should be a random thing for you guys. Randomly call a VC on Friday morning. See what yeah, that's what we're say. doing. We're crank calling people. Can't wait to do it for Mark Andreessen. Crank Marsha. calling on the Friday show with John Furrier. <laughs> yeah, we're going to call in. Can Mark Andreessen, please? Uh, Nate's next. <laughs> All right, Jerry, thanks so much. Talk to you later. Bye, John. Bye. Jerry Chen, a great, great VC. And you know what I love about Jerry Chen? He works hard. He's in the trenches. He's transparent. He's putting it out there. I would say, you know, VC, Greylock certainly has got to do better on on. On, on gender partnership. They got to have better, more more women in the partnership. They need to have more diversity, but you know, great firm. I'm, I'm nitpicking there. All right, that's the Silicon Valley Friday show. And uh, you know, next week we're going to be in KubeCon and we're going to be, we're going to be here in the studio for Friday. And of course, congratulations to the Cubs who won the World Series and potentially we could have the Cubs winning a World Series for the first time since what, 1908 was it? A long time. And then maybe we might have our first president, that, uh, female president by next Friday. By next Friday so, show. so yeah, get out, get, and out, vote. get out and vote and we'll see how this election comes down. <laughs> Man, either way, our world will be completely Glad different as of, Wednesday, as, as of Wednesday morning. <laughs> you know, hopefully they won't have the hanging Chad problem in Florida. <laughs> You're listening to the Silicon Valley Friday show. I'm John Furrier with Jeff Frick and we had Jerry Chen randomly dialing in. We're calling him up and maybe we should do a crank call series on the VC. <laughs> so I mean, it's good, good stuff.
I'm John Furrow, Jeff Frick. Thanks for, for listening to the Silicon Valley Friday show.